Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name is Brian Velker. I'm president of Botanica and the Waterfront Botanical Gardens, and I'm very thrilled to welcome you to our annual meeting. Um, you know, for the past several years, Botanica has gets together at least once a year, um, oftentimes more, but at least once a year to talk about what we've been up to, to celebrate our successes, um, and just to get together and have a little bit of fun. So that's what we're doing tonight. Before we get too far, and let's see if... There we go. Um, I'd like to uh, thank a number of folks who helped to make this evening possible. Uh, we have three very generous uh, corporate sponsors for tonight's event, Stites and Harbison, Wells Fargo, and Brown Foreman. Um, and I'd like to give thank you, thank you to all of them. I'd like to give uh, just a, a special nod to Stites and Harbison. Uh, they have been very, very generous supporters of Botanica for many years. Um, and as uh, Peggy, one of our board members who works at site, said, um, they're really proud to be partnering with Botanica as we work to bring the Waterfront Botanical Gardens to fruition. And they hope that, uh, that the support they show will encourage others to give support as well. So we appreciate everything that they've done for us. Also, there are a number of individuals who helped to make an event like this possible. As you know, if you've thrown events, there's a lot of work that goes into them, and our event committee has been truly wonderful. So thank you for everybody uh, to help make that possible. Um, also, uh, one of the things we want to do tonight is to look back at the past year. This has been a really good year for Botanica. I'm, as a president of the board, I feel really, really pleased with what we've accomplished. And a lot of that progress has been because Botanica is blessed to have a truly tremendous board. These are the folks who are, are tuned in to the project day by day, week by week, month by month. They're helping us to keep it moving forward, and they're helping to set Botanica as an organization up for success. I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge the folks on the board. Save your applause for the end. Uh, but if you happen to be on the board, give us a little wave or stand up. Joining me on the board, we've got Mike Kimmel, our Vice President, Peggy Grant, our Secretary, Pete Peterson, our Treasurer, Kristen Augsburger, John Calloway, Dominic Grotto, Bob Hill, Judy Hunt, Richard Johnson, Alex Lucan, Mary Beth O'Brien, Michael Teig, Dot Wade, and uh, Fergie Garrett. So please join me in thanking them for all their hard work. Uh, some other folks that have made this year a success have been all of the volunteers who have helped Botanica, whether it's rolling up their sleeves and getting in the dirt at the Founders Garden, organizing events, or helping us to plan for fundraising. Uh, their help has really uh, uh, been a, a huge uh, asset as we've been trying to move the project forward. Um, there are three gardening organizations I'd like to give a shout out to, the Louisville Area Daylily Society, the Louisville Area Iris Society, and the Midwest Peony Society. Each of those groups uh, have been so excited about the Founders Garden that we created at the Highgold facade that they looked into their own collections, they pulled out some really remarkable uh, varieties of plants, and they donated those plant materials so that we can make the Founders Garden beautiful and that we could share them with the public. So I'd like to thank them for their partnership. Uh, a lot of the work that we, we uh, did this past year uh, was working with Metro government. Um, our council person, Councilwoman Tina Ward-Pugh, has been a tremendous advocate for Botanica and the project. Uh, we're really, really lucky to have her support. Also, I'd like to thank Mayor Greg Fisher and also uh, Teresa Zawaki. Teresa works in economic development, and she's our primary point person for all of our conversations and dealings with the government. She's been really, really great, so I'd like to thank them. Um, I'd like to give this Best Neighbor Award to uh, Waterfront Development Corporation. That's, that's right. Uh, Mike Kimmel and David Karam and everybody at Waterfront Development Corporation have been really, really helpful to Botanica. Um, they have tons of, of expertise from all of the work that they've done making our riverfront beautiful, and they've helped us in many, many ways. So we look forward to partnering with them even more in the future. And then finally, uh, there have been a lot of groups across uh, Louisville and even on the other side of the river who have helped us to build awareness by inviting folks from Botanica to come talk to their organizations. Um, and so we've been really, really thankful that they've invited us into their meetings to share updates on the project, um, which is also a little plug. If you'd like to have someone from Botanica come to talk to an organization that you're a part of, please let us know. We'd love to do that. You know, there's actually one other group that I'd like to thank. 
drum roll please, and that is all of you. Um, as, as we talk about the progress that we made, we did it because we had the support of all of you guys. Whether it's making donations to the effort, supporting us by being members, or telling your friends, everything that you do to support the Waterfront Botanical Gardens effort helps us to move it forward. So thank you very much for everything you do. If you can, uh, if you, if you can see, uh, this is uh, Bob Hill, one of our board members up on the site. Now this is a couple weeks ago, and I like to think that Bob is praying for rain. <laughs> and we all saw how that turned out. So Bob, we might have you praying for something else in a couple, uh, couple weeks. T don't ask for snow, that was the one request. Um, typically when we talk about the progress that we've been making, we, we look at the different steps and the different milestones for the Botanical Garden Project. But I wanted to talk about organizational growth in a slightly different way. Um, we, we do a ton of work to build awareness for the project, and there's probably not a really great way to get a snapshot of that. But um, what I did is I wanted to show you the people who have signed up for our mailing list. Uh, in green, those are the folks who are on the old-fashioned uh, US Postal Service mailing list, and the, uh, the, green, uh, the blue is our email list. These are people who have heard about the project and they've said, I'm so excited by what you guys are doing that I wanna stay in touch. Please, uh, please let me know how things are progressing. I think it's a, really, it's a good direction to be going in. If we were going in the other direction, it would be people saying, take me off of your list. Um, but I think it shows that we're building some nice momentum for the project. Um, the next, and I promise this is the last chart I'm gonna show you today. Um, the other is uh, the number of folks who support the organization. This is just the number of individuals. And you can see over time, in green we've got our members and in blue we've got our donors. Um, I like to look at this and say, people are, are looking at this project and they're saying, there's something really wonderful going on, I wanna be a part of it and I wanna help make it happen. So, uh, so I'm really excited when we look at numbers like this. You can see right here, we've got 45 diehards who have already renewed their membership for 2014. So if you haven't already done that, we'd love to add you to that list. All right, let's talk about the project. Um, at our annual meeting last year, um, I said to all of you and to the rest of the group that our number one focus was to get a formal commitment of that property for the Botanical Garden. That was the number one thing that we were working on. Um, at the time, we were slugging our way through what I call the great title search. We were tracking uh, the transfer of all of the deeds for over 135 plots of land from the 1830s, when it was first developed by Jacob Geiger, all the way to modern day. The great news is we convinced Metro Louisville that they do in fact own the property and that they could sell it to us. So that was the good news. Yay! That was, that was November of last year. Uh, in May of this year, we opened the Founders Garden. Uh, we gave the high gold facade, which is right next to the future garden, we gave it a much needed front yard and backyard. Um, through the generous support of many of you who bought bricks that went in the Founders Garden pathway right there, um, and our, our engraved bricks end right here, so we've got all of this and all of that to fill with engraved bricks, just in case you were wondering how much opportunity we have. Um, uh, it, was a, a, it was a really interesting first year. We learned a lot of lessons, we'll be honest. Not every plant lived, um, but I think everything there is, is, uh, is alive right now, and I can't wait to see spring when things will fill in a little bit more. Um, we also had a really great group of volunteers just this past weekend put hundreds of bulbs in the Founders Garden. So in spring, it should be pretty spectacular. Um, so that was, uh, that was May of this year. Um, this is maybe one of the least visually interesting slides that you'll see tonight. Um, but in, in, uh, in June of this year, we completed the land survey. That was part of our conversations with Metro Louisville. Um, and uh, we completed that. If you're, if you're a bit of a nerd like I am, this is really interesting. Um, in the original, it shows where all of the old streets were underneath the property back when it was a neighborhood. Um, it also shows us things like where the boundaries are and different elements. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, one question that we frequently get from folks who know the history of the area is whether or not the future garden site will flood. 
So I thought since I had all of you looking at a big screen, I'd point this out. Um, if, you, if you have a catastrophic flood, the worst flood that you'd get in 100 years is oftentimes referred to as the 100-year flood. Um, and so Louisville has a system to show what that flood level would be. Um, if you look here, this is an image of the site, and there's a little blue line that goes all around the perimeter of the site. That is the, the level the water would be at a catastrophic 100-year flood. So you can see the whole top of the site is, would be safe. We're in great shape. Now, I will say that our attendance will probably take a hit if we have the 100-year flood, <laughs> but the plants in the buildings should be in great shape. Later in June um, of this year, Botanica achieved the biggest milestone to date. Uh, we formal, signed a formal agreement um, with Metro Louisville that committed this property for the use of the Botanical Garden, and it lays out a clear path for us to purchase the property. Um, this is what we had been working towards. Uh, it was really, really uh, a big milestone, and, and we did it because of all of the support uh, that you've shown us. One thing that I think is really interesting in how uh, local government works, in order for the mayor to sell the property, Metro Council needs to approve the plan. So just a few weeks ago, our plan went before the Committee on Labor and Economic Development, and then it also went before the full Metro Council. And in both cases, our Botanica's plan to purchase the property and turn it into a botanical garden received unanimous bipartisan support. Let's say that one more time. Unanimous bipartisan support. You don't hear that a whole lot. You don't hear that a whole lot. So we think that we've got something really special here. And then in July of this year, uh, we had a wonderful surprise. Two of our longtime supporters, Emil and Nancy Grazer, have been so inspired by uh, the idea of creating a botanical garden here in Louisville and so excited about the progress that we're making that they decided to offer Botanica a, a matching gift worth roughly a quarter of a million dollars. That means that every donation that's made for our effort will be matched dollar for dollar up to the total of $225,000. Now, Emil and Nancy are here tonight, and I just I, I think you've already uh, joined me in thanking them, but let's thank them one more time for their generosity. Now, I think probably the best way to thank them is to help us hit that goal. So think about us either tonight or as you consider your end of year giving. Um, and then we come to our most recent milestone. There we are. Um, you've heard us, you know that this is a former landfill site. And uh, Botanica knows quite a bit about the site. We know its history. Um, we, we know that there have been several different environmental analysis that have happened over the years, and we have access to all of that data. Um, but one of the things that we needed to do is we, need to, we needed to get some updated numbers, and we needed to fill in a couple holes. Um, so over the past couple weeks, um, wells have been drilled and water has been collected and uh, gas has been measured and a lot of reports have been generated. And uh, just yesterday, we received the initial results from what was found. The good news is there were no surprises. The site is exactly as dirty as we expected it to be. In fact, it's actually a little bit cleaner. So that maybe was a little bit of a surprise. Um, so uh, we're really, really happy with what we found, we think we're in great shape, and we think that this really sets us in a great position uh, to move forward with the rest of the project. That's where we are today. So let's talk about where we go from here. Um, right now, Botanica and its board are in the process of selecting our design team. That's the architect, the building architect, and the landscape architect that are gonna create the vision for what the future garden will look like. Um, we've gone through a very thoughtful process. Uh, we came up with a very large list of all of the firms we, ought to, we thought we ought to consider, both local firms and national firms, and I think we even had some international firms on there. We did our own research looking at what they've worked on in the past, and we called that down to somewhere between 12 and 20 different, uh, different firms. We reached out to them and said, if you're interested in this project, give us your qualifications. Tell us what you've worked on that would be similar, that would make you a good candidate to be considered. Uh, a committee of the board 
culled through those, and we winnowed it down to four finalists. And we've now invited those four finalists um, to come up with proposals for the project. Um, so that'll, we'll get those proposals in the next couple weeks, which I think is really exciting. I mean, something like this is a lot more fun than talking about environmental studies, at least to me. Um, but we should be getting those proposals in the next couple weeks, and I would expect that we'll have selected the design firm um, by January of this coming year. After that, um, and after we, we raise the funds that we need to complete the design process, we'll go through that design process, and fingers crossed, maybe we'll have something to look at uh, next year around this time. We'll see how it all, all turns out. You guys have been so supportive in the past, and you see where we're heading. I, I hope that as you look at the milestones that we've achieved, you feel like Botanica's heading in the right direction, the project is off to a great start, uh, and I'd like to ask you to continue your support in the future. The, the best way to do that right now is to make a donation to help us uh, complete that design work. You can do it just by making a regular donation, or if you'd like, you can buy a brick um, and uh, get your name engraved in the Founders Garden Pathway. A lot of folks uh, use that as a way to show their support, or they use it as a way to acknowledge loved ones that they have or in memory of someone they've lost, or, or maybe for an organization that they've got. If you're interested in buying a brick, we can take care of you at the table out back. Um, also, uh, continuing your membership is a great way to support the organization. And uh, if you'd like to get more involved, if you'd like to roll up your sleeves or get involved in another way, we'd love to have you join us as a volunteer. So consider that, and if you'd like to do any of those things, please come talk to us after tonight's event. And now for the reason why you all showed up. I knew I had to get this in before the main event. So. Uh, many of you have been to Missouri Botanical Garden, and I think so many people in Louisville have been there, that Louisville is green with garden envy. We want one of those here in our town. Uh, Peter Raven led the Missouri Botanical Garden for 39 years. We're going to call it 40. 40 years. Um, and it has really helped to make it the institution that it is today. Um, he's one of the world's leading botanists. And he has, uh, has won accolades for his extensive work in science and conservation. His full bio is in your program, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome Peter Raven. If you'd like a little time before I begin to read my full bio, I'll begin to you know. <laughs> What a thrilling time it is to be here when you have this wonderful opportunity laid before you to build a world-class botanical garden in a wonderful site right near the city, right on the edge of the city, accessible to everyone, a center for children and adults and gardeners and all the people who love the environment, and what an asset it will be for the community from here on out. It's not very often in your life or in the life of a community that you get the chance to participate in starting such a wonderful asset for such a beautiful and progressive community. And by the way, why is this ringing? Can you hear it? I don't know. Hello? Give it another shot. Can you hear me? All right. Well, it's not very often in the lives of any individual or in the lives of any city that you have the opportunity to support, to help launch, and to build a fantastic asset like this that will be valued by your community for decades and probably centuries to come, provided that the 100-year floods don't get up to the 500-year level very often. <laughs> My wife was head of the Mercer Botanical Garden in Houston, which, flooded period, which floods periodically, only completely, so that they have to have the benches all chained down. And as far as I know, you won't be subject to that. Anyway, I envy you that opportunity, and I certainly challenge all of you who can to give generously to help this botanical garden movement go forward. The people who are working on it are as enthusiastic as all the civic leaders in Louisville are generally. You will have a fantastic garden here and you will have it in very short order. And being a part of that team is a privilege that few people have during the course of their lives. So make that match rapidly 
and move on to implementing the plans, the great plans that will be made by the master planners, whom you're the one that you'll select from the four that you have. Now, we thought in planning this event that it might be interesting for you to hear about the history of the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, which is often called Shaw's Garden in, in honor of its founder, but he named it the Missouri Botanical Garden, so that is its name. Uh, uh, and, and to see how it has grown through time and to see what kind of services it provides to possibly give you some ideas on what to do. And I can also assure you, particularly since I'm retired and I won't have to deliver on this personally, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> I can also assure you that the Missouri Botanical Garden will be delighted to do anything that it can to encourage you in this effort to receive delegations, to to uh, provide uh, information about particular parts of the garden or help in any other way that we possibly can. We start, the history of the Missouri Botanical Garden starts in 1859, so it's the oldest botanical garden uh, in the United States <coughs> that's still surviving. Columbia University had a botanical garden when it was down in the Bowery in New York, but that botanical garden was approximately on the side of Rockefeller Plaza, so it didn't last very well. They got rid of it as they spread up the island, but of course Columbia owned a band across the island of Manhattan and sold that to make its endowment for its, for its operations in its new site up on the Upper East Side, Upper West Side. Uh, Henry Shaw, our founder, was born in 1800, so you can tell <coughs> pretty much uh, how old he was from all the years that I'll talk about from here on, and here he is at 35 years old, a very vigorous looking man. Uh, he came to North America from Sheffield in England, and he came as, a, as an agent for his uncle, who was an ironmonger, had a factory manufacturing ironworks in Sheffield, and he came to New Orleans and established a depot there and then brought, after he decided to settle in St. Louis, which was kind of a crossroads for people going west and for developing at that time, he decided to settle in St. Louis and then he could bring the goods up the river as he needed them. It's interesting that there were no ironworks in the Midwest in that day is one of the interesting points about this story because after all the Saugus ironworks north of Boston were started in 1636 and, and ran for three years until they fell the victim of graft and embezzlement by the people who were running it. But lots of our ancestors, certainly some of mine, got here by being sent to the Saugus ironworks by Oliver Cromwell after being captured sent over there to harvest wood for the ironworks, but they lasted only three years, but hundreds of ironworkers came out of that because they imported actually like a hundred skilled ironworkers, and they dispersed all up and down the East Coast, and in fact, it was those ironworkers who were able to make the, the guns, the weapons that were used in the revolution, you know, in the next century, but they didn't get to the Midwest, so here they had to be imported still at that time. Henry Shaw, when he first saw St. Louis as a 19-year-old, thought it was the most horrible-looking place he'd ever seen <laughs> with uh, wooden sidewalks and mud and a small town of, I think, about 6,000 people at that point. But he settled down. He made the most of it. Now, where do I point this? I have to, ah. <laughs> You'll fake it as if I go, click, and then you good. He came up the river on the Maid of Orleans, which is the boat shown here, a steamship, and, and came up uh, uh, to St. Louis and uh, settled there. St. Louis uh, dates to uh, uh, six, uh, 1765, but it was founded there after the French had been farming in the area around St. Louis for about a century, so it was really a matter of the founders selecting an elevated place along the river that they thought would be a, why is it moving? Stop moving it, you. <laughs> wait, wait. Get your hands off that machine or I'll <laughs> drill you. Get a new president, this one has. <laughs> now it isn't moving at all, God. I'm gonna, ah! 
Henry Shaw, uh, actually, by the time he was 40 years old, he got to St. Louis at 19. By the time he was 40 years old, in 1840, he found that he had $250,000 in the bank, which in 1840 was really remarkable, and that he'd made $25,000 that previous year, which was also remarkable. Of course, there were no taxes then, and uh, he didn't need to really be engaged actively in the, in the ironmongery or hardware business after that. And he uh, started investing in land and so forth, and especially uh, set forth to travel in his native England. The gardens of the Duke of Devonshire at Chatsworth, which are shown here, inspired him to found a botanical garden in St. Louis. He had thought of starting a park or something. He was in an interesting situation. You know, you have all these beautiful gardens in England. And you may say, how many of them were started by commoners that are public gardens now? Three. All the others were started by nobility, every single one. And uh, three were started by commoners. So he was really adopting a new role. What do I do now that I'm in the new world to leave kind of a, a mark here that the citizens will enjoy? and uh, how do I do it? And he was also in St. Louis, you know, where people were charting their own future. And he decided that uh, after seeing Chatsworth that a botanical garden would be the place. Joseph Paxton, who, who was the aide to the uh, uh, Duke of Devonshire, uh, Joseph Paxton uh, had been knighted two years earlier for being the first one in England to bring Victoria water lilies into flower, beating out the people at Kew and other places, and had built greenhouses at Chatsworth where you had a beautiful, airy, lacy support for the glass, and that very much impressed Mr. Shaw, and he said, well, a botanical garden would be wonderful. Paxton then, two years later in 1851, which is the year that Shaw visited Chatsworth, was selected because of his wonderful work on those greenhouses to be the architect for the Crystal Palace Exposition of 1851, which was in, a, in effect in a huge greenhouse, uh, and which really showed off the British Empire for the first time in all of it. People really realized what an empire they had when they saw what was in the Crystal Palace Exposition. That building, by the way, was, was moved uh, to Brighton and eventually burned in about 1930, so you could no longer see it. But a lot of people are interested, since Paxton was the architect for the Crystal Palace, that he was actually knighted for bringing Victoria water lilies into bloom two years earlier. <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, that's a picture of Chatsworth, and it's certainly a place that I would encourage you to visit and dream of Daunton Abbey the next time you're in England. <laughs> Daunton Abbey is actually in not there, of course. Now, here's one of uh, Mr. Shaw's early designs for the garden. And uh, you can see this is what's uh, Tower Grove Avenue now. And he, this is the main gate as he, envisioned, as he envisioned it. And then there are gardens around there. And there's a grove behind it. This land, when Henry Shaw was planning his garden, was all open prairie. Uh, and there was a small grove of sassafras trees, right? by the center of it, and he built his house there called Tower Grove House, which I'll show you. Oh, my word. I'll go like this and pretend that I snap it. This is, this is what it looked like as it was getting started out on the prairie there. The French divided the fields coming up from the river into long, narrow strips, and the land that Henry Shaw bought in 1842 was part of one of those strips. They ran all the way down to the river. And this is what it looked like when they were beginning to plant trees out in the prairie. Uh, this is some of the early construction there and what it looked like. And in the back there, let's see. In the back there, nothing. <laughs> There's a picture of Henry Shaw on the balcony of his townhouse which was built three miles outside of the city. It was his country house, and it was constructed in 1849. So he was 51 years old there. See what fun it is to subtract 1,800 from the years? <laughs> now, later on, this is what the plan began to look like to the 
To the south of the garden is Tower Grove Park, which is a 300-acre park that he gave to uh, the city of St. Louis in 1867. And then the garden runs up this way. And this land here, running over to King's Highway, is the part that I'll show you later was sold subsequently in order to raise money to buy the nature reserve, the Arboretum, uh, which is part of the garden's holdings now. Uh, George Engelman was Henry Shaw's principal botanical advisor. He was a German physician, who came, a pediatrician, who came over to St. Louis in 1831 and went into practice in St. Louis being very, very heavily uh, uh, emigrating Germans coming there, mostly ones who were too liberal to get along with the rulers in Prussia and similar places. Uh, they came over and uh, George Engelman was one of the early ones, 1831. Uh, since they were liberals, by the way, it's not surprising that the large German population in St. Louis was the primary factor in keeping Missouri in the North in the uh, Civil War. Uh, if they hadn't been there and had minded their own business and stayed home in Germany, who knows what would have happened. We might have followed the path of Kentucky. Because of course, <laughs> Missouri and Kentucky were the two states that people were wondering about most at the onset of the war. But anyway, George Engelman was a wonderful botanist. All training in botany then was in medical schools. His dissertation was on teratology and plants, sick plants, you know, with viruses and funny looking stems and things. That was his medical school dissertation. And interestingly enough, Goethe, the great German scholar, uh, who himself had written a book on morphology of plants, praised Engelmann's thesis personally, which is kind of a nice connection to the past. <clears throat> anyway, he was the preeminent botanist of the United States other than Torrey and Gray, who were on the East Coast. And he got, he was respected by Asa Gray, the great Harvard botanist, who sent him the plants that he liked, especially like cacti. Engelman discovered and named more than half of the about 100 kinds of cacti that there are in the United States, uh, conifers and other things of that sort. Shaw, after he came back, after deciding to build a botanical garden, naturally wrote the director of Kew, his native garden at home, and said, what should I do if I want to build a botanical garden? What goes in a botanical garden? And he uh, uh, especially championed research and put Shaw in touch both with Asa Gray and Engelman. And Gray, Engelman, and Hooker then plotted and wrote one another to make sure that Mr. Shaw brought the garden into research in botany, into scientific botany. Uh, he got older, that's what happens. He died in 1889 in St. Louis of something that may be coming back, malaria, which of course went that far north then and with global warming could well be back that far north again. Uh, by the way, no one knew what side Mr. Shaw was on in the Civil War. He never left a single word about that or gave a single sign. And I suspect in St. Louis at that time, it was probably best to keep your mouth shut. In 18, he died in 1889. And one of the most significant things he did was in 1885, he endowed and established a professorship of botany which means a new school of botany at Washington University. And he said in his will that that professor should either be the first or second in command at the garden. As a result of that, the garden has a great academic record extending from 1885 to the present, has with Washington University and then later with St. Louis University and with the University of Missouri in St. Louis had hundreds of PhD uh, graduates, including most of the dominant figures in uh, systematic botany who graduated, for example, in the 1920s. <clears throat> and we still maintain that very strong academic connection and research program. Uh, the first director after Henry Shaw was William Trelease. <clears throat> William Trelease was uh, trained at Cornell, 
which was the main place for training in botany in those days, and was busily establishing a botanical garden at the University of Wisconsin when Henry Shaw died. And so he, he, was, he came down before 1889 to uh, be the professor at Washington University in 1885, and then the, the trustees elected him director of the garden on Mr. Shaw's death, which was obviously more or less in, in uh, accordance with Mr. Shaw's wishes. <coughs> Trelease really started the research program at the garden. Henry Shaw himself ran the garden for 30 years, and he didn't really know how to get into it scientifically, but obviously associating with Washington University in the way that he did made that an, an, a necessity, sort of an automatic thing after he passed away. <coughs> but William Trelease definitely knew how to get into it and really got the herbarium and the library and all the other things going in his 23 year span as director. Now that's Tower Grove House, which is Henry Shaw's country house, which was built there in 1849. Uh, three miles outside of the edge of the city when it was built, it was a place you'd go out to the country. And Engelman said, I can't get out to advise you as often as you'd like because it's a three mile ride on horseback away from my practice. Engelman also, by the way, had a very large herbarium which he accumulated over 100,000 specimens which he accumulated himself and which later came to the garden. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was Henry Shaw's country house <clears throat> and he established the botanical garden near that house during the 1850s after he came back from England. The house is now a house museum. That's a picture of the staff in 1890. Uh, looked like an average group on the street here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they look pretty rugged. Mr. Shaw had uh, Italians. There's a huge Italian uh, settlement in St. Louis. Yogi Berra and Joe Garagiola both come from St. Louis. And uh, then the Bohemians came and he hired a bunch of Bohemians and so it went. But anyway, there's the group in front of the area where his mausoleum is housed. A pretty big staff in 1890. There's uh, the mandatory woman on a Victoria leaf playing uh, a violin with Visitors looking on. Uh, by the way, when they, when they discovered that water lily in South America and named it after Queen Victoria, they of course intended it to be a great honor, but she seeing its girth thought it was a comment on her own girth. <clears throat> and after she was told about it said, we are not amused. <laughs> the Victorias are grown from seed every year uh, this is what the gardens look like in his day. You know, a lot of people think, if you think of England, you might think of Sissinghurst or natural areas or the Arboretum at Chatsworth or something. But of course, in mid-Victorian times earlier, uh, this was the kind of garden that was favored, sort of the kind of formal garden you'd see in Hyde Park at the present time. What is that? I can't even see it. <laughs> I have to come around here. <laughs> Who put that? Did you put that in? <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we're offering a special prize. Who can identify? <laughs> The director after William Trelease was, uh, was uh, left in 1912 to really work in the botany department at the University of Illinois was George Moore, who had already been an assistant there. Trelease, by the way, was let out over a characteristic kind of strain that one tends to have in botanical gardens, which generally do include research of some kind. Uh, he, he was more interested in research and the board was more interested in horticulture. And if you read the history of Kew, which is a very interesting history to read, you'll find the same thing was going on there. 
Uh, Trelease, by the way, a good story about him is he always wanted to get rid of a uh, sort of a, a column uh, that, that Henry Shaw had put up in front of his museum in the garden and uh, which Henry Shaw had put up uh, in honor of American science. And the trustees would never let him move it because Mr. Shaw had put it there. And finally he said one day, can I move it 12 feet? And he was leaving the room. They said, what direction? And he said, down. <laughs> So George Moore came in, and then many improvements were made, such as those characteristic lily pools going down to the old main gate, and uh, flower shows came in, uh, and we began having them in the in the early part of the 20th century. By the way, I just heard on television recently somebody said, "Oh, that idea is so 20th century." <laughs> and I said, Oh, <laughs> my time is going by. <laughs> anyway, we've had flower shows continuously from then on and still do in the garden uh, in different places. This floral display hall, which George Moore built, eventually had a plastic roof on it. And uh, I was coming out of the, soon after I got to the garden, I was walking out of the jungle up a path in Costa Rica and we saw these people coming down to us and they said, well, your floral display house has just burned to the ground. And I said, oh, darn. <laughs> uh, we had a uh, snack bar in the floral display house and the roof was plastic and so when it got burning, it just went pshht. <laughs> now, in the 1910s and so forth, uh, smoke from burning sulfur-rich coal from Illinois was such a problem in St. Louis that cars had to turn on their lights when driving downtown, even in midday. And one of them, and of course it started killing lots of plants in the garden, and one of the main plants that it was killing that was of interest were orchids. Why? Because you couldn't fly them in from Hawaii in 1920, you had to grow them there. And the garden uh, and people, of course, had to give corsages to their dates. Women, men had to give them to women. I said that once to a group from Miami University in Ohio, and then I said, what am I talking to? None of you know what a corsage is. Or <laughs> and you certainly have no idea what a date is. <laughs> But anyway, at that point, uh, George Moore presided over purchasing the, uh, the uh, nature reserve, what was called, uh, is called the Shaw Arboretum now, was then called the, uh, something like the Gray Summit Annex of the Missouri Botanical Garden, but I started calling it the Shaw Arboretum, which I thought was easier. Uh, Later on, I w and it's a gorgeous place, it's 2,500 acres, 35 miles southwest of St. Louis on I-44. And I, I first, uh, I started thinking about it when I was there. We, it's, it hasn't been developed so much for horticulture, except we have a beautiful wildflower garden there. And the glades are wonderfully restored, and it's really a, it's really a gorgeous place. Uh, but. Uh, in about uh, 1980, I was sitting in a meeting out there and I was musing to myself, how would I explain, how could we explain to the public what an arboretum was? And I was thinking about it and then the coin dropped and I realized that if we did explain to the community what an arboretum was, they would realize that we didn't have one there, <laughs> which, was, uh, which was a bad idea. So we did a study and then renamed it the Shaw Nature Reserve, which is really what it is. Um, by the way, when I was at the 100th anniversary of the Arnold Arboretum, I went into the men's room and there was a guy there with great bushy hair and all black hair and a big beard and he says, and he said, uh, what is this arboretum? And I explained it to him, he said, ah, I thought it had something to do with abortion. <laughs> anyway, that's what our glades look like when we clean the, 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 the uh, weed trees off of them. 
and we have restored boardwalks, restored uh, wetland areas. We have uh, a wetland area. You know, you can restore wetland areas in appropriate places with the approval of the Corps of Engineers to be sold as mitigation for other wetland areas that are destroyed. So that's uh, actually in there quite valuable because you really, the law is very serious about that and you really have to do it. But that's a very beautiful lake that we've restored in the nature reserve. And uh, the nature reserve's a particularly wonderful place for educating children, uh, getting them out of the city and out to a really beautiful country place nearby. <laughs> and people there learn how to connect with nature. That happens to be the daughter of Bill Klein, who had a long career in botanical gardens and passed away some years ago, uh, showing about the close connection between children and nature at the Nature Reserve. Now, oops, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, no, that was right. You were two ahead. No. That's the Merrimack River at the Nature Reserve. It has three miles of the Merrimack River in it, which is one of the many beautiful streams that come down out of the Ozarks. And uh, uh, it goes directly into the Mississippi River. Uh, we have lots of classes, lots of nature activities, all kinds of things like that there. Now, <coughs> uh, George Moore, <coughs> who was the director of the garden after uh, William Trelease, he was director of the garden from 1912 to 1953. And by that time, look who's talking, he was pretty long of tooth, so they kind of forced him out because he, he basically didn't know, and his style of governance was that anyone who wanted a new light bulb in the garden needed to come and ask him as director personally, <laughs> which didn't work very well. So the director then was uh, Fritz Wendt, this man, who had most of his, who actually, uh, in his doctoral dissertation, he was born in Indonesia when it was a Dutch possession. In his doctoral dissertation in the Netherlands, he discovered auxin, which was the first plant hormone to be discovered. And then he had a very distinguished career at Caltech. And uh, he was um, getting jostled pretty hard by the youngsters at Caltech by 1958 and uh, decided to come and be director of the Missouri Botanical Garden. That was after a lapse of five years since George Moore had left. Things were kind of floating in St. Louis generally as they were in many places after the war because of the increased cost of labor and so forth. But Fritz Wendt had a plant growth installation at Caltech called the Phytotron, uh, which was the, uh, an elegant uh, plant growth facility <clears throat> and he cast around to try to find a way that the old disintegrating greenhouse in the garden, Victorian greenhouse, could be replaced. And he particularly wanted to have a greenhouse that had no internal subdivisions uh, so that the climates could go through it, you know, and long across. We heat could come in one side and go out the other side. This climatron is 90 feet high and about a half acre and it was the first use of Buckminster Fuller's principles to uh, build a greenhouse. Buckminster Fuller was in residence in uh, Edwardsville, right across the river at Southern Illinois University. Uh, and so this was built according to his principles. And it's interesting, they built the framework for this uh, geodesic dome in 1959. It opened in 1960 uh, before they knew what would uh, cover it. They were thinking of things like polythene, like plastic bags, and they finally decided on, uh, on lucite, plexiglass, and it was really the first structural use of plexiglass for a building. And uh, then it's a, an aluminum frame, and the plexiglass, see how the, you can see air through there? The plexiglass is suspended, the dome is suspended underneath the aluminum frame by airplane wire. Later on, we had to replace that because the plexiglass, you know, as, as it will do, got hit so much that it got discolored and it got to be plumb dark in there. <laughs> so we rebuilt the dome of steel and glass. They had many kinds of glass that could be used for it by now. 
in uh, 1989, but it had lasted nearly 30 years by that time, which was longer than they imagined it would last. And it's a wonderful display of tropical plants in the Climatron. And that's sort of what it looks like inside the paths. That's the new circulation plan for the Climatron. And the paths in there are so, are so well designed that you f it feels a lot larger than a half acre when you're in there. And there's also a big gradient going down from the front to the back end. And it feels very much larger than it is. And it's a great way to show tropical plants. It was the second largest geodesic dome that had been built in when it was built in 1959. The only larger one was in Baton Rouge. Uh, and then, of course, many bigger ones were built later. Aw, what's that? Something's wrong. Maybe. I think there's supposed to be writing on the right here. Ah. Oh, that's right. I forget that this thing is worthless. All I can do is. <laughs> but the point I'm getting to now is that beautiful scientific and display gardens don't happen by accident. <laughs> a well thought out master plan is essential. I'm supposed to be able to go, Shee, but no. Uh, and Go on. <laughs> a master plan has to be constructed according to the mission statement of the institution. This is the garden's mission statement. <clears throat> Believe it or not, it took us two full days to work this out. Working out mission statements is not very easy, but it's very worthwhile to discover. But this one is quite admired among other botanical gardens to discover and share knowledge about plants and their environment in order to preserve and enrich life. And we took out the human life and just put life, finally, and I think that pretty well has it all for us. Uh, so, ah, wait a minute, was that one ahead of where I wanted to? That's what you need to do. Okay. <laughs> you got my back? <laughs> Every botanical garden, now one of the most interesting and meaningful things about botanical gardens is that every one of them is completely different. You know, the missions of art museums are somewhat different, but they generally speaking have quite a bit in common. But botanical gardens, that's not quite necessarily true. They can emphasize a lot of different things from pure emphasis on children to science with very small gardens and, you know, on and on. But uh, that's something that you need to really think out very carefully here. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, maybe it needs more thought. But it is really the words of the master plan that will have the major, uh, uh, words of the mission that will have the major effect on how you design the master plan. <clears throat> when I got to the garden in 1971, the 79 acres that are in the garden now are, are there essentially by accident, not by design. The part uh, west of the garden was sold, as I said, in 1925 to buy the nature reserve. That defined its border on that side. The south end of the garden was sold to the Federated Garden Clubs, their headquarters in the south end of the garden, so they have seven acres. And uh, the other boundaries are just as they may be, and of course, from Shaw's plan that I showed you earlier, the garden has just built up, built up uh, first of all, kind of in a vacuum out in the fields, but then later surrounded by houses. The whole part west of the garden, in other words, to the left there, uh, to the right rather, developed uh, after, the, after the land there was sold to uh, developers because of the uh, arboretum of course, getting the money to buy the Arboretum. And they, uh, master plans need to be revised frequently. We, we changed ours and redrew it at least every five years from then onward. We started out uh, thinking about the uh, master plan. You know, you think of a designer as coming and doing the master plan, but actually it becomes a living work which involves the whole community of staff, trustees, members, everyone else who's interested in the institution and keeps getting modified as you go along, so you keep redrawing it. 
Uh, the main thing is it's like a gigantic game of checkers. You can't pile them on top of one another. In many parks, for instance, utility lines and things or water lines and so forth are put in in places that you want to put up buildings later and then you can't do it. And we really realized that we couldn't, uh, <coughs> we really couldn't develop anything in the undeveloped part of the garden until we had a master plan. We started out thinking about putting in more benches and, and water fountains and things, and then regular fountains, because of course in hot climates like ours, fountains are a fantastic asset for people who come. Shade is a fantastic asset, water to drink and places to sit, but you keep revising it as you go along. That's, that's a certain version of our master plan. One of the most important things we did in the course of developing this was Here's the Climatron, and here's the old entrance of the garden, the one that Henry Shaw opened in 1859. And we moved the entrance down to here, the Ridgeway Center, and put parking here. There's no parking around this entrance. And uh, oriented it this way, when you come in this way, the Climatron is so overwhelming that it may well be the only thing you look at. And actually, we were trying to signal in a way, in addition to adding parking, gift shops, restaurants, and things right there. We we're trying to signal that there were things to see all around the garden. This lake in the, in the uh, southwest corner of the garden was planned before we decided to put the Japanese garden there, but it was designed as kind of a, a, a target for people to go to, a place that they'd want to go to on a visit in the garden, a place they'd definitely want to see that would draw them through all the other gardens. Every garden should have its own sense of place. And you know, one of the things you really need to think about in developing your own master plan when you start working with these planters is, what's the signature of your garden? What do you really want a garden in Louisville to look like? For example, do you want it to reflect some of the pioneer history or what? Our children's garden uh, represents mid-19th uh, mid century Missouri, so it emphasizes Henry Shaw, or 19th century Daniel Boone, Lewis and Clark, Sacagawea, and so forth in the, in the design. You can do various things like that, and you can be as specific as you would like to. Part of the local flavor of the garden, of course, is to spend a good amount of it on native plants so you could show what the vegetation around there is like. And I, I would hope that you'll, you'll, of course, have informal annexes now for children and other people taking classes at the garden. But I think it would be logical for you to think about some natural areas to put under your wing later on to emphasize native plants further. Uh, I'll just go ahead. I'll pretend that I'm advancing you. Since you all can read, I... <laughs> but all of those are important things in deciding what the flavor of the garden is like, the vernacular style, and you obviously will not want a garden here that looks exactly like the gardens in other places. For one thing, uh, hot weather, uh, relatively cold winters, uh, the need for shade, for water, for lots of things, for plants that will grow here, which is a shifting target because of climate change. All of those things need to be taken into account in designing a proper master plan. Uh, accessibility is a very big thing in gardens. We started doing that intuitively when I got there, but. Uh, but the Americans with Disabilities Act came in you know, after 1971, and that puts us ahead of most countries in the world on accessibility to people who are physically disadvantaged and is a very, very important thing for gardens, whether you had any laws or not. Uh, well, that speaks for itself. Some kind of transportation some kind of design. Japanese gardens are very popular because the Japanese gardening style is so popular. 
When we built ours in 1975, there were still some people sore at having getting sunk in their boats in the Pacific Ocean during World War II, but uh, they got over it. Uh, and our Japanese garden, which is 14 and a half acres, is now the, the, the single place that most people come to the garden to see in our annual Japanese festivals. So this is another big consideration. Just run these all out so I wouldn't have to nod my head too often. <clears throat> these are some of the audiences that we have at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, science audiences, local visiting public. Oops, you go back one, yeah. <laughs> we can go on the road after this maybe as a comedy act. Uh, <laughs> local visiting public, tourist visitors, and they have somewhat different, they have somewhat different needs, although they overlap strongly. Uh, the community that surrounds the garden, in this case, the waterfront park, the houses that would be built nearby, restaurants and things like that. Uh, people that benefit from research, showing research, showing new horticultural plants, uh, and uh, government and other officials who provide funding <clears throat> we were fortunate eventually to get admission to a zoo museum district in St. Louis, which uh, was established earlier to take care of the institutions whose fund, the zoo and the art museum primarily, whose funding went to nothing. They were owned by the city as the city shrank, because it's a circumscribed area right in the middle. And then in uh, 1971, just before I got there, there was a vote to create a taxing district on property tax, which doesn't require a uh, year-to-year negotiation that funds them from St. Louis County and St. Louis City. And it provides about $10 million of our $40 million budget at the Garden. Volunteers are extremely important. You're obviously off to a great start with volunteers, but the volunteers in the garden itself are extremely important. We have about 2,000 <coughs> volunteers at the Missouri Botanical Garden who come in at least once a week. Uh, we have 42,000 members and about 500 staff members, about a third of whom are in research. We have about 50 PhDs, but Volunteers are a community that a garden reaches as well as they help it. Uh, and it, it's a way of making a really useful impact on the community in itself. In other words, it would be good even if they didn't do any good for the garden. But the amount of good that 2,000 volunteers do for a garden is obviously equivalent to having a much larger staff than one really has. And they work with every department in the garden, whether it's uh, maintenance or you know, people who were woodworkers or carpenters or whatever to secretarial work to a lot in education and as gods and, and on and on, horticultural volunteers. <clears throat> Everybody wants to be a horticultural volunteer and pick out little seedlings and put them in pots and things. So you can raffle those off for enormous prize, no. <laughs> And then you have to think about what's your product. Just run these out too. And in our case, it's understanding wild plant communities better, finding improved uh, varieties for horticulture, helping to teach people how to have a healthier environment, uh, a beautiful place to enjoy and relax. And, and that is really Perhaps the biggest visitor use of botanical gardens in general, simply a place where they like to go and enjoy and relax in a beautiful, calm setting. Large numbers of mothers with children in baby carriages. We get many, St. Louis University is right there, we get many people coming over and praying or meditating, just sitting on benches in a quiet, beautiful place. And uh, that's something always to remember. And recreational activity, we have concerts there, free concerts every Wednesday night in the summer. Uh, and children learning about nature and of course educated citizens. There are many things that, many important principles that people can be taught uh, calmly in the, in the presence of botanical garden, either through your lectures, your newsletters, or the experience of being there. 
So a master plan, this is kind of what, what a master plan does in the light of everything that I've just said, gives structure like a spine, it guides everyday management decisions, sets style standards, allows for changing needs and new technology, allows for infrastructure planning, and any new gardens that are proposed have to fit somewhere in there. I mean, the plan has to be changed or what have you. As you develop the garden, you'll have huge interest in the community, as they say, different elements opening, but you've got to sort of know where those elements are down the line while you're doing that to be able to do it effectively, because obviously you don't build it all at once. Some of the things that have been built during my tenure are the John S. Lehman building. You can see Tower Grove House there in the back, and the building in the front with the one-way glass uh, is the John S. Lehman building, which is the first new housing for our herbarium and library. We have one of the best, we have one of the 10 best uh, herbaria in the world, about 7 million specimens now. It was about 1.8 when I got there and we have one of the best botanical libraries in the world, so it makes it a great center for study. And of course, our Japanese garden, which I've already pointed, these are more recent development, our Japanese garden, which I already pointed out, which is a great destination. And uh, our home gardening center, which has 26 individual gardens with different styles of home gardening represented in them for different purposes. And is a great place to learn. It has sort of a residential looking building of 10,000 square feet that's full of uh, exhibits about horticulture and practical gardening and so forth. And we are very close cahoots with the nursery industry in Missouri and uh, bordering Illinois. Uh, and we show trial, trial beds of new annuals and some perennials in there every year that are given to us by the people who are developing them. And of course, the, the breeding of new varieties of garden flowers operates at a tremendous speed, and it's great to show them off. And that's our boxwood garden. Uh, if you're a bird flying over and at the right angle, you can see that the initials HS for Henry Shaw are spelled out in that garden. But I don't know, but I've forgotten how. <laughs> anyway, it's a very pretty formal boxwood garden. And that's a rock garden and our, and our uh, Mediterranean house, which is plants of uh, uh, temperate climates, more temperate climates than the Climatron. And then three years ago, we added a children's garden, which I already mentioned as having a 19th century theme. And a lot of people hate the children's garden because they say it's like Disneyland in a botanical garden, which ought to be a quiet and formal place. But what we found studying the uh, visitation at the zoo was, for example, that young male parents would go to the zoo. I don't know. Is it? Ah, yeah. Young male, male parents would go to the zoo with their children and with their wives, and then we got totally women with very small children. And when we built the children's garden, which is uh, six and a half acres, then we started getting lots of couples coming. And of course, you need that to kind of build a community. It has, a, as I've said a couple of times, a 19th century Missouri theme. Uh, and all the plants in there are native Missouri plants and so forth. So it's very educational and very useful for that purpose also and really very popular. Special exhibits have been very important for us. When we had a major Chihuly exhibit, which I suppose some of you saw, many botanical gardens did, although Chihuly has sort of given up exhibiting in botanical gardens now after a great burst of doing it. We actually netted $3 million in that exhibit. It's quite extraordinary and uh, quite wonderful. I mean, the community loved it. And we kept quite a few things like those Walla Walla onions, which we put out in the central lily pools and so forth. And if you want to buy them for your own home, they're about $30,000 a piece, which shows that Chihuly knows how to make money. <laughs> 
There's another view of our boxwood garden in case you didn't capture it the first time. No. <laughs> well, that's our butterfly house. A butterfly house was built out in one of the county parks. We're right in the middle of the city, and, and the city in St. Louis has gone from 900,000 people in 1950 to uh, 300,000 people today, so taxes and everything else are in real trouble. So our butterfly house, which is there, is right out in the middle of the uh, uh, fast-growing part of the county and uh, is really a place that people do enjoy and, of course, obviously a great place to teach people about nature. And that was built by another group, and then we eventually acquired it when they wanted a more solid base of support over time. That's what the garden looks like at night. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, oh, okay. You say, why are we looking at that again? We're looking at that again because Henry Shaw could not have foreseen the problems we face now and what a garden needs to do. Uh, we get all of our food from plants. I mean, they're very central to us. You may not know that we get 90% of it from 103 kinds of plants out of the 400,000 that exist. We get 60% of it from three kinds of plants, corn, rice, and wheat. And uh, yet thousands and thousands of kinds of plants have been grown for food in the past. Uh, that's a picture of the butterfly house, which shows that even the best of us don't get the slides in exactly the right place. <laughs> no, actually it wasn't. Go back to it and I'll, I'll cover up even better. <laughs> that shows the linkages in nature, the way that whole communities are linked and that, for example, bees and other pollinators from the coupled relationships that exist in nature come out and provide valuable services to cultivated plants. And that illustrates the fact that the genetic diversity of plants has never been more important than it is now because with global climate change and other serious environmental changes going on, we need to keep the genetic diversity around as much as we can to be able to keep the plants growing in the places that they'll have to grow in the future. One of my colleagues said, is there enough, who's a serious geneticist, is there enough genetic diversity in wheat to allow it to grow in the places that it will have to grow 50 years from now. Uh, you see, it doesn't just go on forever. You can't, I mean, there probably is, but it's gonna take hard work. And this again demonstrates ecological services together with a lovely quote by Rachel Carson, because beauty is surely one of those ecological services that's so important to us. It is a wholesome and necessary thing for us to turn again to the earth and in contemplation of her beauties to know of, what does that say? Uh, somebody's messed it up, I don't know. You get the idea, it's all very lovely, go on. Did you change the wording on these images? I and then many of our plants have real hopes for the future. And some of the possible things that we want to get from them are shown on there. And sustainable sources of food, new foods and medicines, chemical feedstocks, sustainable ecosystems, new ways to purify soil and water, sustainable sources of energy. And all of those things can be provided by plants, which also are of key importance in simply maintaining the beauty in our lives. Now we've gone through another day. No, go ahead. <laughs> and these are the kind of messages that should come out of a rounded botanical garden and a botanical program. A lot of our hope for the future will depend on plants and how we use them. And of course, the reasons are obvious, population growth. It's interesting, for example, that when Thomas Malthus said the world uh, would uh, starve because we couldn't produce enough food to feed a growing population in the 1790s, the world population was about 850 million 
about the size of the population of sub-Saharan Africa now. And of course, it got through without such starvation, with certainly with hundreds of millions of people starving, but without the effects that he thought about, largely because of advances in agriculture that came about as part of the Industrial Revolution. But we're now up to 7.1 billion, growing at 200,000 people a day. Every day there are 200,000 more people at the dinner table than there were the night before. I was born in 1936. There are three people on Earth now for every one who was here when I was born. And of course, it just cannot really go on. Invasive aliens are racking a toll on uh, plants and animals all over the world. Global warming will exacerbate everything else. On the right there are uh, different models and how hot it will get in the future. People talk about talking about it again in 2020, but meanwhile the temperature goes on rising and it will change all the conditions on Earth during that period of time. And of course, one of the ways that we can show that very clearly is through changes in horticultural zones. Uh, and you can see, just look where the zones are there in relation to Kentucky or Missouri or anything else in just a 16 year period if you wanna know how fast the climate is changing. And you know what we have in St. Louis now as a result of all of that? Armadillos. <laughs> Possum on the half shell. <laughs> <laughs> They've come about 90 miles north. And, you, and, I, and I wanna tell you something. You don't wanna have armadillos in your garden. They are not good. But we also have camellias growing out of doors, which we never could have imagined having when I moved there. Introduce pests like the bark beetles that can grow in new areas and uh, kill trees, for example, by having three broods rather than two have killed millions of fir trees, for example, on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. All those things are spreading faster and faster. And the reason I'm talking about these things is these are all lessons that a botanical garden can emphasize in its educational programs and for the benefit of the people of Louisville and the surrounding area. And they're really important er lessons because they're gonna affect the quality of life for everyone in the future, whether they know anything about what's going on or not. Extinction rates for plants are extremely fast. We can get this by looking at the fossil record. Uh, historically, about one kind of plant every three years. Um, since 1500, when we had movable type, about one to 10 per year. And now over 10 per year disappear and we we are increasing so rapidly that thousands will disappear per year in the future, which makes conservation of plants a very important topic. More than half of plant species might be lost by the turn of the century or after the turn of the century, but it all depends on how we control it or what we do about it. And a botanical garden like the wonderful one that you're determined to build here can teach many of the lessons that we. Oh, come on. Stop it. This is the most. Dang. Did you hear about the cowboy who rode into a town where he hadn't been before? And he, and he said, uh, tied up his horse, and he says, I'll have a whiskey. And uh, so they bring him the whiskey, and he looks outside where he tied up his horse, and it's gone. So he says, so with that, he pulls his six-shooter out, puts it on the bar, twirls the chamber, and says, boys, I sure hope I don't have to do what I had to do the last time this happened to me. This is for you, so. <laughs> So about two minutes later, his horse was back. And this tall guy came over, put his hand on his shoulder and said, say, I just can't resist asking, 
what is it that you had to do the last time this happened to you? He said, I had to walk back to my hotel. <laughs> I don't know if we're, either it doesn't actually matter very much, I can wrap up without any, but are we likely to have any or? Yeah. <laughs> now this will work, no? Oh yeah, see they disappeared, that's the meaning of the words all disappearing. Now, preventing extinction, this is a very important thing, and you all really should teach about this, and in part, I think, do it. Documenting plant species, uh, set aside natural areas, saving especially endangered species, learning how to combat invasive species, including keeping them out of the horticultural trade in the area, and provide alternatives to gathering species in nature. And this is in the way of documentation. This is in the way of growing them in botanical gardens, uh, herbarium, and propagating them in the bottom. It seems more and more important to put their seeds in seed banks where they can be kept for a long time than it used to because of the rapidly changing climates, which mean that the venerable model of growing them in botanical gardens and then setting them back out into natural areas gets to be even dicier than it would be anyway planting them back out in nature. Uh, so a modern botanical garden, sort of summarizing what I've been talking about, a quiet oasis for enjoyment, relaxation, and learning is probably the top purpose of it as a physical entity in the community. But uh, its immediate community can be strengthened and nurtured. People can be educated to understand our complete dependency on plants and to manage them and respect them discover knowledge about plants of whatever level, of whatever kind you decide to do and propagate it and apply that knowledge. So the kind of relationships between plants and animals and pollinators, migrating monarch butterflies, volunteers, which we've talked about, uh, and teaching children about nature. There's nothing probably more important than we do in a community than teach children about nature because it will both enrich their lives in understanding where they are and what they're looking at, but it will also make them better and more responsible citizens in general in the future. Uh, and there are many, many ways that this can be done. We have about 200,000 children a year coming through the garden. Numbers don't really matter. Quality of experience really matters, but I suspect that you'll be able to develop nice partnerships with the school district that will really facilitate this. And we have many of these activities at many of our facilities. The ultimate reason that people will reach stability in the environment is, however, a moral one, you know, beyond all the statistics and things that I've given you. And all major religions and philosophical systems for that reason emphasize the need to preserve the stability of the place that we live. I particularly like this quote uh, from uh, second chapter of Genesis uh, which is place the earthling in the Garden of Eden, the earth, to serve and preserve it. And uh, that's really our obligation. And I think that's the only thing that will change people's mind and their activities soon enough or quickly enough to, to arrest the runaway destruction of the earth. We use now about one and a half times what the earth can produce, you know, regularly. Uh, sustainably, so we're running down the earth, yet in the seven billion people that we have, we have about a billion who are malnourished. And yet the population estimates of the World Bank now go up to 11 billion uh, before it stabilizes. Sub-Saharan Africa has 950 million people, about the same number that the whole world did in the 1790s, and it's projected to go up to two point from 900 50 million to 2.2 billion by 2050. 
And if you think about the problems in Africa now, you can see why that poses real difficulties that we really have to begin to pay much better attention to. So we could conclude by looking at how, and thinking about how beautiful the Earth is, which certainly is easy to appreciate on a day like this here in Louisville with autumn coming on. This happens to be Ha Long Bay in Vietnam. And another quote from Rachel Carson, probably has several repeated phrases in it. <laughs> Let me stagger over here. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. And the wonderful botanical garden that you're building, which you will contribute to personally and which you will have the joy of starting and really making a lasting contribution to your community, to the children in the community, and to the people who will live here for a long time times, decades, and probably centuries to come, that garden will be like a lens that will help us all and help the people of this area to contemplate the beauty of the earth, to preserve it, to appreciate it, and to build a sounder Louisville, a sounder state, and a sounder world in the future. So it's a wonderful venture, one that I'm very happy to have seen in, at this vigorous early stage <coughs> and really commend to your attention for your gifts, your support, your volunteering, or in any way that you want to participate in this great adventure that's starting so beautifully here. Thank you very much. Thank you.